the undead myth and realities. He comes from the grave, his body a home of worms and filth, no life in his eyes, no warmth of his skin, no beating of his breath, his soul as empty and dark as the night sky. He laughs at the blade, spits at the arrow, for they will not harm his flesh. For eternity he will walk the earth, smelling the sweet blood of the living, feasting upon the bones of the damned. Beware, for he is the living dead. Obscure Hindu text, circa 1000 BCE. Zombie. Also, zombies, plural. 1. An animated corpse that feeds on living human flesh. 2. A voodoo spell that raises the dead. 3. A voodoo snake god. 4. One who moves or acts in a daze, like a zombie, a word of West African origin. What is a zombie? How are they created? What are their strengths and weaknesses? What are their needs, their desires? Why are they hostile to humanity? Before discussing any survival techniques, you must first learn what you are trying to survive. We must begin by separating fact from fiction. The walking dead are neither a work of black magic nor any other supernatural force. Their origin stems from a virus known as solanum, a Latin word used by Jan Vanderhaven, who first discovered the disease. Solanum, the virus. Solanum works by traveling through the bloodstream, from the initial point of entry to the brain, through means not yet fully understood. The virus uses the cells of the frontal lobe for replication, destroying them in the process. During this period, all bodily functions cease. By stopping the heart, the infected subject is rendered dead. The brain, however, remains alive but dormant, while the virus mutates its cells into a completely new organ. The most critical trait of the new organ is its dependence on oxygen. By removing the need for this all-important resource, the undead brain can utilize, but is in no way dependent upon, the complex support mechanism of the human body. Once mutation is complete, the new organ reanimates the body into a form that bears little resemblance, physiologically speaking, to the original corpse. Some bodily functions remain constant, others operate in a modified capacity. The remainder shut down completely, this new organism is a zombie, a member of the living dead. 1. Source Unfortunately, extensive research has yet to find an isolated example of solanum in nature. Water, air, and soil in all ecosystems from all parts of the world have turned up negative, as have their accompanying flora and fauna. At the time of this writing, the search continues. 2. Symptoms The timetable below outlines the process of an infected human, give or take several hours depending on the individual. Hour 1. Pain and discoloration, brown, purple, of the infected area, immediate clotting of the wound, provided the infection came from a wound. Hour 5. Fever, 99 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Chills, slight dementia, vomiting, acute pain in the joints. Hour 8. Numbing of the extremities and infected area. Increased fever, 103 to 106 degrees Fahrenheit. Increased dementia, loss of muscular coordination. Hour 11. Paralysis in the lower body, overall numbness, slowed heart rate. Hour 16. Coma. Hour 20, heart stoppage, zero brain activity. Hour 23, reanimation. 3, transference. Solanum is 100% communicable and 100% fatal. Fortunately for the human race, the virus is neither waterborne nor airborne. Humans have never been known to contract the virus from elements in nature. Infection can occur only through direct fluidic contact. A zombie bite, although by far the most recognizable means of transference, is by no means the only one. Humans have been infected by brushing their open wounds against those of a zombie, or by being splattered by its remains after an explosion. Ingestion of infected flesh, provided the person has no open mouth sores, however, results in a permanent death rather than infection. Infected flesh has proven to be highly toxic. No information, historical, experimental, or otherwise, has surfaced regarding the results of sexual relations with an undead specimen. But, as previously noted, the nature of solanum suggests a high danger of infection. Warning against such an act would be useless, as the only people deranged enough to try would be unconcerned for their own safety. 
Many have argued that given the congealed nature of undead bodily fluids, the chances of infection from non-bite contact should be low. However, it must be remembered that even one organism is enough to begin the cycle. 4. Cross-Species Infection Solanum is fatal to all living creatures, regardless of size, species, and or ecosystem. Reanimation, however, takes place only in humans. Studies have shown that solanum infecting a non-human brain will die within hours of the death of its host, making the carcass safe to handle. Infected animals expire before the virus can replicate throughout their bodies. Infection from insect bites such as from mosquitoes can also be discounted. Experiments have proven that all parasitic insects have sensed that and will reject an infected host 100% of the time. 5. Treatment Once a human is infected, little begin can be done to save him or her because solanum is a virus and not a bacteria. Antibiotics have no effect. Immunization the only way to combat a virus is equally useless as even the most minute dosage will lead to a full-blown infection. Genetic research is underway. Goals range from stronger human antibodies to resistant cell structures to a countervirus designated to identify and destroy solanum. This and other more radical treatments are still in the early stages with no foreseeable success in the near future. Battlefield experiences have led to an immediate severing of infected limbs, provided this is the location of the bite. But such treatments are dubious at best, with less than a 10% success rate. Chances are the infected human was doomed from the moment the virus entered his or her system. Should the infected human choose suicide, he should remember that the brain must be eliminated first. Cases have been recorded in which recently infected subjects deceased by means other than the virus will nonetheless reanimate. Such cases usually occur when the subject expires after the fifth hour of infection. Regardless, any person killed after being bitten or otherwise infected by the undead should be immediately disposed of. See Disposal, page 19. 6. Reanimating the Already Deceased it has been suggested that fresh human corpses could reanimate if the solanum were introduced after their demise. This is a fallacy. Zombies ignore necrotic flesh and therefore could not transfer the virus. Experiments conducted after World War II, see Recorded Attacks, page 216, FF, have proven that injecting solanum into a cadaver would be futile because a stagnant bloodstream could not transfer the virus to the brain. Injecting directly into a dead brain would be equally useless as the expired cells could not respond to the virus. Solanum does not create life, it alters it. Zombie Attributes 1. Physical Abilities Too often, the undead have been said to possess superhuman powers, unusual strength, lightning speed, telepathy, etc. Stories range from zombies flying through the air to their scaling vertical surfaces like spiders. While these traits might make for fascinating drama, the individual ghoul is far from a magical omnipotent demon. Never forget that the body of the undead is, for all practical purposes, human. What changes do occur are in the way this new reanimated body is used by the now infected brain. There is no way a zombie could fly unless the human it used to be could fly. The same goes for projecting force fields, teleportation, moving through solid objects, transforming into a wolf, breathing fire, or a variety of other mystical talents attributed to the walking dead. Imagine the human body as a toolkit. The sunambulist brain has those tools, and only those tools, at its disposal. It cannot create new ones out of thin air, but it can, as you will see, use these tools in an unconventional combinations, or push their durability beyond normal human limits. A. Sight. The eyes of a zombie are no different than those of normal human. While still capable, given their rate of decomposition, of transmitting visual signals to the brain, how the brain interprets these signals is another matter. Studies are inconclusive regarding the undead's visual abilities. They can spot prey at distances comparable to a human, but whether they can distinguish a human from one of their own is still up for debate. One theory suggests that the movements made by humans, which are quicker and smoother than those of the undead, is what causes them to stand out to the zombie eye. Experiments have been done in which humans have attempted to confuse approaching ghouls by mimicking their motions and adopting shambling, awkward limp. To this date, none of these attempts have succeeded. It has been suggested that zombies possess night vision, a fact that explains their skill at nocturnal hunting. This theory has been debunked by the fact that all zombies are expert night feeders, even those without eyes. 
B. Sound. There is no question that zombies have excellent hearing. Not only can they detect sound, they can determine its direction. The basic range appears to be the same as that for a human. Experiments with extreme high and low frequencies have yielded negative results. Tests have also shown that zombies are attracted by any sounds, not just those made by living creatures. It has been recorded that ghouls will notice sounds ignored by living humans. The most likely, if unproven, explanation is that zombies depend on all their senses equally. Humans are sight-oriented from birth, depending on other senses only if the primary one is locked. Perhaps this is not a handicap shared by the walking dead. If so, it would explain their ability to hunt, fight, and feed in total darkness. C. Smell Unlike with sound, the undead have a more acute sense of smell. In both combat situations and laboratory tests, they have been able to distinguish the smell of a living prey above all others. In many cases, the given ideal wind conditions, zombies have been known to smell fresh corpses from a distance of more than a mile. Again, this does not mean that ghouls have a greater sense of smell than humans, simply that they rely on it more. It is not known exactly what particular secretion signals the presence of prey, sweat, pheromones, blood, etc. In the past, people seeking to move undetected through infested areas have attempted to mask their human scent with perfume, deodorants, or other strong-smelling chemicals. None were successful. Experiments are now underway to synthesize the smells of living creatures as a decoy or a repellent to the walking dead. A successful product is still years away. D. Taste Little is known about the altered taste buds of The Walking Dead. Zombies do have the ability to tell human flesh apart from that of animals, and they prefer the former. Ghouls also have a remarkable ability to reject carrion in favor of freshly killed meat. A human body that has been dead longer than 12 to 18 hours will be rejected as food. The same goes for cadavers that have been embalmed or otherwise preserved. Whether this has anything to do with taste is not yet certain. It may have to do with the smell, or perhaps another instinct that has not been discovered. As to the exactly why flesh is preferable, science has yet to find an answer to this confounding, frustrating, terrifying question. E. Touch. Zombies have literally no physical sensations. All nerve receptors throughout the body remain dead after reanimation. This is truly their greatest and most terrifying advantage over the living. We as humans have the ability to experience physical pain as a signal of bodily damage. Our brain classifies such sensations, matches them to the experience that instigated them, and then files that information away for use as a warning against future harm. It is this gift of physiology and instinct that has allowed us to survive as a species. It is why we value virtues such as courage, which inspires people to perform actions despite the warnings of danger. The inability to recognize and avoid pain is what makes The Walking Dead so formidable. Wounds will not be noticed and therefore will not deter an attack. Even if a zombie's body is severely damaged, it will continue to attack until nothing remains. F. Sixth Sense Historical research coupled with laboratory and field observations have shown that The Walking Dead have been known to attack even when all their sensory organs have been damaged or completely decomposed. Does this mean that zombies possess a sixth sense? Perhaps. Living humans use less than 5% of their brain capacity. It is possible that the virus can stimulate another sensory ability that has been forgotten by evolution. This theory is one of the most hotly debated in the war against the undead. So far, no scientific evidence has been found to support either side. G. Healing Despite legends and ancient folklore, undead physiology has been proven to possess no powers of regeneration. Cells that are damaged stay damaged. Any wounds, no matter what their size and nature, will remain for the duration of the body's reanimation. A variety of medical treatments have been attempted to stimulate the healing process in captured ghouls. None were successful. This inability to self-repair, something that we as living humans take for granted, is a severe disadvantage to the undead. For example, every time we physically exert ourselves, we tear our muscles. With time, these muscles rebuild to a stronger state than before. A ghoul's muscle mass will remain damaged, reducing its effectiveness every time it's used. H. Decomposition The average zombie lifespan, how long it is able to function before completely rotting away, is estimated at 3-5 to five years. As fantastic as this sounds, a human corpse able to ward off the natural effects of decay 
Its case is rooted in basic biology. When a human body dies, its flesh is immediately set upon by billions of microorganisms. These organisms were always present in the external environment and within the body itself. In life, the immune system stood as a barrier between these organisms and their target. In death, that barrier is removed. The organisms begin multiplying exponentially as they proceed to eat and therefore break down the corpse on a cellular level. The smell and discoloration associated with any decaying meat are the biological processes of these microbes at work. When you order an aged steak, you are ordering a piece of meat that has begun to rot. It is formerly toughened flesh softened by microorganisms breaking down its sturdy fiber. Within a short time, that steak, like a human corpse, will dissolve to nothing, leaving behind only material too hard or innutritious for any microbe, such as a bone, teeth, nails, hair. This is the normal cycle of life, nature's way of recycling nutrients back into the food chain. To halt this process and preserve dead tissue, it is necessary to place it in an environment unsuitable for bacteria, such as in extreme low or high temperatures, in toxic chemicals such as formaldehyde, or, in this case, to saturate it with solanum. Almost all microbe species evolve in normal human decomposition have repeatedly rejected flesh injected with the virus, effectively embalming the zombie. Were this not the case, combating the living dead would be as easy as avoiding them for several weeks or even days until they have rotted away to bones. Research has yet to discover the exact cause of this condition. It has been determined that at least some microbe species ignore the repelling effects of solanum, otherwise the undead would remain perfectly preserved forever. It has also been determined that natural conditions such as moisture and temperature play an important role as well. Undead that prowl the bayous of Louisiana are unlikely to last as long as those in the cold, dry Gobi Desert. Extreme situations such as deep freezing or immersion in preserved fluid could, hypothetically, allow an undead specimen to exist indefinitely. These techniques have been known to allow zombies to function for decades, if not centuries. See Recorded Attacks, page 193 FF. Decomposition does not mean that a member of the Walking Dead will simply drop. Decay may affect various parts of the body at different times. Specimens have been found with brains intact but nearly disintegrated bodies. Others with partially rotted brains may control some bodily functions but be completely paralyzed in others. A popular theory has recently circulated that attempts to explain the story of ancient mummy as one of the first examples of embalmed zombies. The preservation techniques allowed it to function several thousand years after being entombed. Anyone with a rudimentary knowledge of ancient Egypt would find this story almost laughably untrue. The most important and complicated step in preparing a pharaoh for burial was removal of the brain. I. Digestion. Recent evidence has once and for all discounted the theory that human flesh is the fuel for the undead. A zombie's digestive tract is completely dormant. The complex system that processed food, extract nutrients, and excretes waste does not factor into a zombie's physiology. Autopsies conducted on neuralized undead have shown that their food lies in its original, undigested state at all sections of the trap. This partially chewed, slowly rotting matter will continue to accumulate as a zombie devours more victims until it is forced through the anus or literally burst through the stomach or intestinal lining. While the more dramatic example of a non-digestion is rare, hundreds of eyewitnesses reports have confirmed undead to have distended bellies. One captured and dissected specimen was found to contain 211 pounds of flesh within its system. Even rarer accounts have confirmed that zombies continue to feed long after di their digestive tracts have exploded from within. J. Respiration the lungs of the undead continue to function in that they draw air into and expel it from the body. This function accounts for the zombie's signature moan. What the lungs and body chemistry fail to accomplish, however, is to extract oxygen and remove carbon dioxide. Given that solanum obviates the need for both of these functions, the entire human respiratory system is obsolete in the body of a ghoul. This explains how the living dead can walk underwater or survive in environments lethal to humans. Their brains, as noted earlier, are oxygen independent. K. Circulation It would be inaccurate to say that zombies have no heart. 
It would not be inaccurate, however, to say that they find no use for it. The circulatory system of the undead is little more than a network of useless tubes filled with congealed blood. The same applies to the lymphatic system, as well as all other bodily fluids. Although this mutation would appear to, have to give the undead one more advantage over the humanity, it has actually proved to be a godsend. The loss of fluid mass prevents easy transmission of the virus. Were this not true, hand-to-hand -hand combat would be nearly impossible, as the defending human would almost certainly be splattered with blood and or other fluids. L. Reproduction Zombies are sterile creatures. Their sexual organs are necrotic and impotent. Attempts have been made to fertilize zombie eggs with human sperm and vice versa. None have been successful. The undead have also shown no signs of sexual desire, either for their own species or for the living. Until research can prove otherwise, humanity's greatest fear, the dead reproducing the dead, is a comforting impossibility. M. Strength Ghouls possess the same brute force as the living. What power can be exerted depends greatly on the individual zombie. What muscle mass a person has in life would be all he possesses in death. Unlike a living body, adrenal glands have not been known to function in the dead, denying zombies of the temporary burst of power we humans enjoy. The one solid advantage the living dead do possess is amazing stamina. Imagine working out or any other act of physical exertion. Chances are that pain and exhaustion will dictate your limits. These factors do not apply to the living dead. They will continue to act with the same dynamic energy until the muscles supporting it literally disintegrate. While this makes for progressively weaker ghouls, it allows for an all-powerful first attack. Many barricades that would have exhausted three or even four physically fit humans have fallen into a single determined zombie. N. Speed The walking dead tend to move at a slouch or a limp even without injuries or advanced decomposition. Their lack of coordination makes for an unsteady stride. Speed is mainly determined by leg length. Taller ghouls have larger strides than the shorter counterparts. Zombies appear to be incapable of running. The fastest have been observed to move at a rate of barely one step per 1.5 seconds. Again, as with strength, the dead's advantage over the living is their tirelessness. Humans who believe they have outrun their undead pursuers might do well to remember the story of the tortoise and the hare, adding, of course, that in this instance, the hare stands a good chance of being eaten alive. O. Oh, agility. The average living human possesses a dexterity level 90% greater than the strongest ghoul. Some of this comes from the general stiffness of necrotic muscle tissue, hence their awkward stride. The rest is due to their primitive brain functions. Zombies have little hand-eye coordination, one of their greatest weaknesses. No one has ever observed a zombie jumping, either from one spot to another or simply up and down. Balancing a narrow surface is similarly beyond their ability. Swimming is also a skill reserved for the living. The theory has been put forth that if an undead corpse were to be bloated enough to rise to the surface, it could present a floating hazard. This is rare, however, as the slow rate of decomposition would not allow for byproduct gas to accumulate. Zombies who walk or fall into the bodies of water will more likely find themselves wandering aimlessly across the bottom until eventually dissolving. They can be successful climbers, but only in certain circumstances. If zombies perceive prey above them, for example, in the second story of a house, they will always attempt to climb it. Zombies will try to scale any surface, no matter how unfeasible or even impossible. In all the easiest situations, these attempts have met with failure. Even in the case of the ladders, when simple hand-over-hand -hand coordination is required, only one in four zombies will succeed. 2. Behavioral Patterns A. Intelligence It has been proven time and again that our greatest advantage over the undead is our ability to think. The mental capacity of the average zombie ranks somewhere beneath that of an insect. On no occasion have they shown any ability to reason or employ logic. Attempting to accomplish a task, failing, then by trial and error discovering a new solution, is a skill shared by many members of the animal kingdom, but lost on the walking dead. Zombies have reportedly failed laboratory intelligence tests set to at the level of rodents. One field case showed a human standing at one end of a collapsed bridge with several dozen zombies on the other side. One by one, the walking dead tumbled over the edge in a futile attempt to reach him. 
At no time did any of them realize what was happening and change their tactics in any way. Contrary to myth and speculation, zombies have never been observed using tools of any kind. Even picking up a rock to use as a weapon is beyond their grasp. This simple task would prove the basic thought process involved in realizing that a rock is a more efficient weapon than the naked hand. Ironically, the age of artificial intelligence has enabled us to identify more easily with the mind of the zombie than that of our more primitive ancestors. With rare exceptions, even the most advanced computers do not have the ability to think on their own. They do what they are programmed to do, nothing more. Imagine a computer programmed to execute one function. This function cannot be paused, modified, or erased. No new data can be stored. No new commands can be installed. This computer will perform that one function over and over until its power source eventually shuts down. This is the zombie brain, an instinct-driven unit task machine that is impervious to tampering and can only be destroyed. B. Emotions. Feelings of any kind are not known to the walking dead. Every form of psychological warfare, from attempts at enraging the undead to provoking pity, have all met with disaster. Joy, sadness, confidence, anxiety, love, hatred, fear, all of, those, all of these feelings and thousands more that make up the human heart are as useless to the living dead as the organ of the same name. Who knows if this is humanity's greatest weakness or strength? The debate continues, and probably will forever. C. Memories a modern conceit is that the zombies retain the knowledge of its former life. We hear stories of the dead returning to their places of residence or work, operating familiar machinery, or even showing acts of mercy to loved ones. In truth, not a shred of proof exists to support this wishful thinking. Zombies could not possibly retain memories of their former lives in either the conscious or the subconscious mind, because neither exists. A ghoul will not be distracted by the family pet, living relatives, familiar surroundings, etc. No matter who a person was in his former life, that person is gone, replaced by a mindless automaton with no instinct other than for feeding. This begs the question, why do zombies prefer urban areas to the countryside? First, the undead do not prefer cities, but simply remain where they are reanimated. Second, the main reason zombies tend to stay in cities instead of farming out into the countryside is because an urban zone holds the highest concentration of prey. D. Physical Needs Other than hunger, discussed later, the dead have shown none of the physical wants or needs expressed in the mortal life. Zombies have never been observed to sleep or rest under any circumstances. They have not re reacted to extreme heat or cold. In harsh weather, they have never sought shelter. Even something as simple as thirst is unknown to the living dead, defying all laws of science. Solanum has created what could be described as a completely self-sufficient organism. E. Communication Zombies have no language skills. Although their vocal cords are capable of speech, their brain is not. The only vocal ability appears to be a deep-throated moan. This moan is released when zombies identify prey. The sound will remain low and steady until the physical contact is made. It will then shift in tone and volume as the zombie commences its attack. This eerie sound, so typically associated with The Walking Dead, serves as a rallying cry for other zombies, and, as has been recently discovered, is a potential psychological weapon. See On the Defense, page 74. F. Social Dynamics Theories have always proliferated that the undead function as a collective force, from an army controlled by Satan, to an insect-like pheromone-driven hive, to the most recent notion that they achieve group consensus by telepathy. The truth is that zombies have no social organization to speak of. There is no hierarchy, no chain of command, no drive toward any type of collectivization. A horde of the undead, regardless of size, regardless of appearance, is simply a mass of individuals. If several hundred ghouls converge on a victim's location, it is because each one is drawn by its own instinct. Zombies appear to be unaware of one another. Individuals have never been observed to react to the sight of one another in any range. This goes back to the question of sense. How does a zombie distinguish between one of its own and a human or other prey in the same range? The answer has yet to be found. Zombies do avoid one another in the same way they avoid inanimate objects. When they bump into one another, they make no attempt to connect or communicate. 
Zombies feasting on the same corpse will tug repeatedly on the meat in question rather than shove the competitor out of the way. The only suggestion of communal effort is seen in the notorious swarm attack, the moan of ghoul calling others within earshot. Once they hear the wail, other walking dead will almost always converge on its source. An early study theorized that this was a deliberate act, that a scout used its moans to signal the others to attack. However, we now know that it happens purely by accident, the ghoul that moans at the detection of does so as an instinctive reaction, not as an alert. G. Hunting. Zombies are migratory organisms, with no regard for territory or con concept of home. They will travel miles and perhaps, given time, cross continents in their search for food. Their hunting pattern is random. Ghouls will feed at night and during the day. They will stumble through an area rather than, than deliberately searching it. Certain zones or structures will not be signaled out as more likely to contain prey. For example, some have been known to search farmhouses and other rural structures, while others in the same group have moved by without even a glance. Urban zones take more time to explore, which is why the undead remain longer in these areas. But no building will take precedence over another. Zombies appear to be totally unaware of their surroundings. They do not, for example, move their eyes in a way that would take in the information of a new setting, shuffling silently with a thousand yard stare. They will wander aimlessly regardless of the location until the prey is detected. As discussed earlier, the undead possess an uncanny ability to home in on a victim's precise location. Once the contact is made, the previously silent, oblivious automaton transforms into something more closely related to a guided missile. The head turns immediately in the direction of its victim, the jaws drop, lips retract, and from the depths of its diaphragm comes a moan. Once contact is made, zombies cannot be distracted by any means. They will continue to pursue their prey, stopping only if they lose contact, make a successful kill, or are destroyed. H. Motivation why do the undead prey on the living? If it has been proven that human flesh serves no nutritional purpose, why does their instincts drive them to murder? The truth eludes us. Modern science combined with historical data has shown that living humans are not the only delights on the undead menu. Rescue teams entering into an infested area have consistently reported them stripped of all life. Any creatures, no matter what their size or species, will be consumed by an attacking zombie. Human flesh, however, will always be preferred to other life forms. One experiment presented a captured specimen with two identical cubes of meat. One human, one animal. The zombie repeatedly chose the human. Reasons for this are still unknown. What can be confirmed beyond any shadow of a doubt is that instinct brought on by Selenum drives the undead to kill and devour any living creature they discover. There appear to be no exceptions. I. Killing the undead. While destroying the zombie may be simple, it is far from easy. As we have seen, zombies require none of the psychological functions that humans need to survive. Destruction or severe damage of the circulatory, digestive, or respiratory system would do nothing to a member of the walking dead, as these functions no longer support the brain. Simply put, there are thousands of ways to kill a human and only one way to kill a zombie. The brain must be obliterated by any means possible. J. Disposal Studies have shown that Solanum can still inhabit the body of a terminated zombie for up to 48 hours. Exercise extreme care when disposing of undead corpses. The head in particular possesses the most serious hazard, given its concentration of the virus. Never handle an undead corpse without protective clothing. Treat it as you would any toxic, highly lethal material. Cremation is the safest, most effective way of disposal. Despite rumors that a pile of burning corpses would spread a solanum in a cloud of smoking plague, common sense would dictate that any virus is unable to survive intense heat, to say nothing of an open flame. K. Domestication? To reiterate, the zombie brain has proved so far to be tamper-proof. Experiments ranging from chemicals to surgery to electromagnetic waves have yielded negative results. Behavioral or modification therapy and other such attempts to train the living dead, like some kind of pack animal, have similarly met with failure. Again, the machine cannot be rewired. It will exist as is, or will not exist at all. The Voodoo Zombie If zombies are the creation of a virus and not black magic, then how does this explain the so-called voodoo zombie? 
a person who has died and been raised from his grave and is doomed to spend eternity as a slave of the living? Yes, it is true that the word zombie originally comes from the Kimbudu word inzumbe, a term describing a dead person's soul, and yes, zombies and zombification are integral parts of the Afro-Caribbean religion known as voodoo. However, the origin of their name is the only similarity between the voodoo zombie and the viral zombie. Although it is said that the voodoo hoonigans, priests, can turn humans into zombies by magical means, the practice is rooted in hard, undeniable science. Zombie powder, the tool used by the hoongin for zombification, contains a very powerful neurotoxin. The exact ingredients are a closely guarded secret. The toxin temporarily paralyzes the human nervous system, creating a state of extreme hibernation, with the heart, lungs, and all other bodily functions operating at minimal levels. It would be understandable if an inexperienced coroner declared the paralyzed subject to be dead. Many humans have been buried while in such a state, only to awaken screaming in the pitch darkness of their coffin. So what makes this living human a zombie? The answer is simple. Brain damage. Many who are buried alive quickly use up the air inside their coffins. Those who are recovered, if they are lucky, almost always suffer brain damage from lack of oxygen. These poor souls shamble about with little cognitive skills or, indeed, free will, and are often mistaken for the living dead. How can you distinguish a voodoo zombie from the genuine article? The telltale signs are obvious. 1. Voodoo zombies show emotion. People suffering from zombie powder-induced brain damage are still capable of all normal human feelings. They smile, cry, even growl with anger if hurt or otherwise provoked, something real zombies would never do. Voodoo zombies exhibit thought. As has been stated before, when a real zombie encounters you, it will immediately home in like a smart bomb. A voodoo zombie will take a moment to try and figure out who or what you are. Maybe it will come towards you. Maybe it will recoil. Maybe it will continue its observation as its damaged brain attempts to analyze the information given it. What a voodoo zombie will not do is raise its arms, drop its jaw, unleash a hellish moan, and stumble directly towards you. 3. Voodoo zombies feel pain. A voodoo zombie that trips and falls will undoubtedly hold its bruised knee and whimper. Likewise, one already suffering from some other wound will nurse it, or, at the very least, be aware of the wound's existence. Zo voodoo zombies will not ignore deep gashes in their bodies like a real zombie would. 4. Voodoo zombies recognize fire. This is not to say that they are afraid of open flames. Some that have suffered severe brain damage may not remember what fire is. They will stop to examine it, perhaps even reach out to touch it, but they will recoil once they realize it causes pain. 5. Voodoo zombies recognize their surroundings. Unlike real zombies who only recognize prey, voodoo zombies will react to the sudden changes in light, sound, taste, and smell. Voodoo zombies have been observed watching television or brightly flashing lights, listening to music, cringing at thunder, and even taking notice of one another. This last fact has been critical in several cases of misidentification. Had the zombies in question not reacted to each other, they looked at each other, made noises, even touched each other's faces, they might have been accidentally exterminated. Voodoo zombies do not have hypersense. A human who has suffered from the debilitating effects of zombie powder is still a sight-dependent human. He cannot operate perfectly in the dark, hear a footstep at 500 yards, or smell a living being in the wind. Voodoo zombies can actually be surprised by someone walking up behind them. This is not recommended, however, as a frightened zombie might react in anger. 7. Voodoo zombies can communicate. While this is not always the case, many of these individuals can respond to audiovisual signals. Many understand words, some even comprehend simple sentences. Many voodoo zombies possess the ability to speak simply, of course, and are rarely for extended conversations. 8. Voodoo zombies can be controlled. While not always true, many brain-damaged humans have lost much of their self-realization, making them very susceptible to suggestion. Simply shouting for a subject to halt or even go away can be enough to get rid of a voodoo zombie. This has created the dangerous situation of confused people believing they could control or train true zombies. Several times, headstrong humans have insisted they could simply command their living dead attackers to stop. As cold, rotting hands grabbed their limbs and dirty, worn teeth bit into their flesh, 
These people discovered, too late, what they were truly dealing with. These guidelines should give you a good idea of how to tell a voodoo zombie from a true zombie. One final note. Voodoo zombies are almost always encountered in Sub-Saharan Africa, the Caribbean, Central and South America, and the Southern United States. Although it is not impossible to find someone who has been turned into a zombie by a hoonigan elsewhere, the chances of such an encounter are slim. The Hollywood Zombie Since the living dead first stepped into the silver screen, their greatest enemy has not been hunters, but critics. Scholars, scientists, and even concerned citizens have all argued that the movies depict the living dead in a fantastic, unrealistic fashion. Visually stunning weapons, physically impossible action sequences, larger-than-life human characters, and above all, magical, invincible, even comical ghouls have all added their colors to the controversial rainbow that is the zombie movie. Further criticism argues that this style over substance approach to the synambulist cinema teaches human viewers lessons that may get them killed in a real encounter. These serious charges demand an equally serious defense. While some zombie movies are based on actual events, at the behest of the filmmakers and or their states, the titles of those movies based on true life stories have been omitted. Their goal, indeed, the goal of almost every movie in every genre, has always been, first and foremost, to entertain. Unless we are discussing pure documentaries, and even some of those are sweetened, movie makers must take some artistic license to make their work more palatable to the audience. Even movies that are based on actual events will sacrifice pure realities for good storytelling. Certain characters will be an amalgam of real-life individuals. Others may be purely fictional in order to explain certain facts, fa facilitate the plotline, or simply add flavor to the scene. One might argue that the role of the artist is to challenge, educate, and enlighten her audience. That may be true, but try imparting knowledge to an audience who has either left or fallen asleep within the first 10 minutes of the picture. Accept the basic rule of movie making and you will understand why Hollywood zombie films stray, in some case wildly, from the reality on which they are based. In short, use these photo plays as their makers intended, as a source of temporary light-hearted entertainment and not a visual aid for your survival. Outbreaks Although each zombie attack is different given the number, terrain, reaction of the general populace, etc., its level of intensity can be measured in four distinct classes. Class 1 this is a low-level outbreak, usually in a third-world country or first-world rural area. The number of zombies in this class outbreak ranges between 1 and 20. Total human casualties, including those infected, range from 1 to 50. The total duration from the first case to the last, known, will range between 24 hours and 14 days. The infested area will be small, no larger than a 20-mile radius. In many cases, natural boundaries will determine its limits. Response will be light, either exclusively civilian or with some additional help from the local law enforcement. Media coverage will be light, if present at all. If the media is present, look for common stories like homicides or accidents. This is the most common type of outbreak and also the easiest to go unnoticed. Class 2. Urban or densely populated rural areas are included in this level of outbreak. Total zombies will range between 20 and 100. Total human casualties may reach as high as several hundred. The duration of a class 2 attack may last no longer than a class 1 outbreak. In some cases, the larger number of zombies will spark a more immediate response. A rural, sparsely populated outbreak may extend to a 100 mile radius, while in urban outbreaks may encompass only several blocks. Suppression will almost certainly be organized. Bands of civilians will be replaced by local, state, even federal law enforcement. Look for an additional, if low-level, military response, the National Guard in the United States or its equivalent abroad. Most often, so as to ease panic, these units will take a more non-combatant role, providing medical assistance, crowd control, and logistical support. Class 2 outbreaks almost always attract the press. Unless the attack occurs in a truly isolated area of the world, or one where the media is strictly controlled, the story will be reported. This does not mean, however, that it will re be reported accurately. Class 3. A True Crisis Class 3 outbreaks, more than any other, demonstrate the clear threat posed by the living dead. Zombies will number in the thousands, encompassing an area of several hundred miles. The duration of the attack and a possible lengthy mop-up process could last as long as several months. There will be no chance for a press blackout or cover-up. 
even without media attention, the sheer magnitude of the attack will leave too many eyewitnesses. This is a full-blown battle, with law enforcement replaced by units of the regular military. A state of emergency will be declared for the infested zone, as well as neighboring areas. Expect martial law, restricted travel, ration supplies, federalized services, and strictly monitored communications. All these measures, however, will take time to implement. The initial phase will be one of chaos, as those in power come to grips with the crisis. Riots, looting, and widespread panic will add to their difficulties, further delaying an effective response. While this is happening, those living within the infected areas will be at the mercy of the undead. Isolated, abandoned, and surrounded by ghouls, they will have only themselves to depend on. Class 4. See Living in an Undead World. Pages 154 to 81. Detection. Every undead outbreak, regardless of its class, has a beginning. Not that the enemy has been defined, the next step is early warning. Knowing what a zombie is will not help you if you are unable to recognize an outbreak before it's too late. This does not entail building a zombie command post in your basement, sticking pins in a map, and huddling around the shortwave radio. All it requires is looking for signs that would slip by the untrained mind. These signs include 1. Homicides, in which the victims were executed by headshots or decapitation. It has happened many times. People recognize an outbreak for what it is and try to take matters into their own hands. Almost always, these people are declared murderers by the local authorities and prosecuted as such. 2. Missing persons, particularly in wilderness or uninhabited areas. Pay careful attention if one or more of the search members end up missing. If the story is televised or photographed, watch to see what level of armament the search parties carry. Any more than one rifle per group could mean that this is more than just a simple rescue operation. 3. Cases of violent insanity, in which the subject attacked friends or family without the use of weapons. Find out if the attacker bit or tried to bite his victim. If so, are any of the victims still in the hospital? Try to discover if any of these victims mysteriously died within days of their bite. 4. Riots are other civil disturbances that began without provocation or other logical causes. Common sense will dictate that the violence on any group level does not simply occur without a catalyst, such as a racial tension, political action, or legal decision. Even so-called mass hysteria can always be traced to a root source. If none can be found, the answer may lie elsewhere. 5. Disease-based deaths in which either the cause is undetermined or seems highly suspect. Deaths from infectious diseases are rare in the industrialized world, compared to a century ago. For this reason, new outbreaks always make the news. Look for those cases in which the exact nature of the disease is unexplained. Also, be on the alert for suspicious explanations such as West Nile virus or mad cow disease. Either could be examples of a cover-up. 6. Any of the above in which media coverage was forbidden. A total press blackout is rare in the United States. The occurrence of one should be regarded as an immediate red flag. Of course, there are, may be many reasons other than an attack of the living dead. Then again, any event causing a government as media conscious as our own to clamp down merits close attention. The truth, no matter what it is, cannot be good. Once an event has tripped your senses, keep track of it. Note the location and its distance from you. Watch for similar incidents around or near the original site. If, within a few days or weeks, these incidents do occur, study them carefully. Note the response of law enforcement and other government agencies. If they react forcibly with each occurrence, chances are that an outbreak is unfolding.